This is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and this evening I'm going to read and reflect on Aesop's fable of the spendthrift and the swallow. The spendthrift and the swallow. Remember that any time we read Aesop's fables, we seek to read the, the fable carefully to learn all of its details, then to paraphrase the fable, to, to retell it in our own words, to make sure we understand it, that all of the details are clear, then to consider the characters, to consider the moral of the fable. What is the moral lesson or what are the moral lessons that Aesop is teaching us? And then finally, to reflect on how this fable and its moral can be applied to our own lives to help us live wisely and virtuously. So let's read together Aesop's fable of the spendthrift and the swallow. A prodigal young fellow, a prodigal young fellow who had run through all his money and even sold all his outer clothes except his cloak, seeing a swallow skimming over the meadows one fine day in early spring, believed that summer was really come, and so he sold his cloak too. The next morning there happened to be a severe frost and shivering and nearly frozen himself, he found the swallow lying stiff and dead upon the ground. He thereupon upbraided the poor bird as the cause of all his misfortunes. Stupid thing, said he, had you not come before your time I should not now be so wretched as I am. This is Aesop's fable of the spendthrift and the swallow. So let's consider now the details of this fable. First of all, we learn that there are two characters in this fable. There is a boy, a young man, it says, a young fellow, and there is a bird, a boy and a bird. We're told a little bit about this young man. We're told he is a prodigal. We're told he's a prodigal. And prodigality, prodigality is a vice. It's one of the vices. Prodigality simply means wasting money. Wasting money. And the money is normally wasted on pleasures, on physical pleasures. So this young man is a prodigal. He wastes money on his pleasures. He practices this vice of prodigality. We know about prodigality because in the New Testament we read Jesus's parable of the prodigal son who had done the same thing. He took money or received money from his father and it says he went and wasted all that he had. That's prodigality. And in the, the biblical story, the prodigal son ends up with nothing because he's wasted everything. And it's very common for people to think that they can pursue their pleasures. And this is especially true when there's money to spend. And prodigal people don't think about what will happen when their money runs out. They usually can't think ahead because they're so concerned with the, pursu the pursuit of their immediate 
pleasures. They can't think or see past the end of their nose. All they can think about is their pleasure. They can't even think about what's going to happen when the money runs out. And it's very difficult to obtain money. So this young man is a prodigal. He's a money-wasting, pleasure-seeking person. And because he wastes all his money, he starts selling his necessary things. He starts selling off things that are useful, like his outer clothes, we're told. So this would be like selling your hat and your gloves, selling your coat, selling your winter boots. Because you think, oh, I wish I could have that money because I could use that money to buy some candy or I could buy some video games or I could buy some toys to play with. Or maybe I could buy some, some alcohol. So he sells necessary things to try and find more money. And he is left at a point where all he's got are his basic clothes. It's like having just your shirt, pants, and maybe a sweatshirt. That's all that he's got left. He's sold off everything in pursuit of his pleasures. And all he's got left is, let's say, a a light jacket or sweatshirt. And it's, it's early spring, so it's like March... And he's walking about one day and he sees a swallow, which is a small bird. And the sight of the bird suggests to him that it must be springtime. Winter must be over. And so it's like in America, it's like for us to see a robin. When you see robins, normally that means that spring is coming. But this prodigal, seeing this bird as a sign that warm weather is coming, which is true, it's true that the presence of a springtime bird is in fact a sign that spring is coming. But it doesn't mean that cold weather won't rise up again. This is true in in farming and gardening. It's deceiving because we often think that spring begins, let's say, March 20th. But if you look in your area, you can find this in an almanac or, or on the internet. You can find out When the last frost date is in your area, and you'll be surprised that it's often much later than the beginning of spring. The last frost date is usually sometime in April. And so you can still have freezing weather even in the springtime. This is why farmers and gardeners plant their crops at certain times. They try to get to a point where they're safe past the last freeze date because if the plants sprout and begin to grow and a freeze comes, it can kill an entire crop. So normally farmers wait until the last freeze date has come and then They get going with their planting, so everything is safe. But for a foolish person like this prodigal young man, he doesn't think carefully like that. He's not working. He doesn't think like a working person. He is eager to to take more clothes off because he will sell them for more pleasure. So he's looking for the first sign of warm weather. 
And as soon as he sees it, he rashly makes the decision to sell his warm clothes so he can obtain more of his pleasures, selling the very last things he possesses. And he takes this gamble that seeing this bird is a sign that no more cold weather will come, and he sells off the last of his warm clothes, his cloak or jacket. But like I said, the the bird is a sign that warm weather is coming, but it's still not a sign that all cold weather is past. And so what happens to this foolish prodigal is that a cold spell comes, actually kills this bird, and this boy is stuck with nothing warm to wear because he sold off the last of his warm clothes. And so what does this boy do? What he should do is blame himself for being so foolish. He should be angry at his sin. He should be angry at his prodigality. He should be angry at himself. And this anger directed at his own sin should be what gets the process of repentance going in his life. He should be angry at his sin and say, I'm never going to waste money again. I'm never going to pursue these pleasures again. This is so foolish what I'm doing. I went and sold all my clothes knowing that cold weather still could come. How foolish my pleasures, my desire for pleasure has led me to act. I have to get my life in order. I have to get control of myself because this prodigality, this foolishness is going out of control. But he doesn't respond in this way. But he foolishly and irrationally blames the bird And he says, you stupid bird, if you didn't show up, I would never have done this, as if it's the bird's fault. The bird, unlike the boy, is an irrational creature. The bird is simply acting out of its nature. It's just doing what its instincts lead it to do with no reason, and that's why It's easy for the bird to act prematurely and end up getting killed by this cold weather. But the boy, who is is a rational creature composed of body and soul, made to the image and likeness of God, he has no excuse for why he's living like an irrational bird. And yet this foolish selfish, prodigal young man will pretend that the bird is to blame. The bird made him do it. The bird made him sell all his clothes. In his his foolish mind, it's the bird's fault. And so we see here how the mind of a sinner works. So the moral of this fable, the moral, of, and we can think of several morals for this fable. First of all, we're warned to not be wasteful, not to be prodigal. We're warned not to indulge the desires of our flesh. We're also warned not to try to blame others irrationally for our own sins and choices. So there's a number of good moral lessons that can be drawn from this fable. 
I think we should choose two of them. First, we can quote a passage of the New Testament from St. Paul in Romans. Make no provision for the flesh with its lusts. Make no provision for the flesh with its lusts. After all, pleasure is the source of prodigality. Make no provision for the flesh. Learn to live a temperate life with self-control and you won't be tempted to prodigality. And the second key moral is to take responsibility for our own sins and do penance. Take responsibility for our own sins. So how does this fable help us in our lives? Well, obviously there are many helpful lessons to be gained from this fable. First of all, we're warned of the danger of our pleasures, of seeking pleasure. Seeking pleasure isn't innocent because pleasures, pleasures cost money. They cost us money, they cost us time, and there are better things that we could do with that money and time. We could use money we have to invest to do business. We could use money we have to invest to buy books or pay for studies. We can use money that we have to do works of mercy, which are good for our souls. There are many good things that we can do with the money that we do have and wasting it on unnecessary pleasures is never a good idea. So we have to beware of our pleasures. We have to learn to live a temperate life, to live according to a rule. What is your rule of life? If you don't have a rule of life, where will you find one? A good place to start, I would recommend, is the rule of St. Benedict. The rule of St. Benedict is a basic Christian rule of life, and it gets into all of these things. It gets into questions of what we should eat, what we should drink, what we should wear, how we should live, and it's intended for it's intended for monastic life, but it provides us with good principles for any Christian life. But we need to live according to a rule of life so that we're not just subject to the desires of our bodies, which are irrational and need to be ruled over by reason. So that's the first application we can make. We need to learn to live according to a rule of life and be temperate. Secondly, we need to make good use of our money. We need to use money we have for good things. Invest money we have in business opportunities. Invest money we have in study opportunities. Invest money we have in doing the works of mercy and so on. Make good responsible use of the money that we do have and don't waste it on pleasures. And then most importantly, thirdly, we have to learn that when we make bad decisions or when we are acting sinfully, we have to tell the truth. We have to blame ourselves. We have to confess our sins and we have to do penance. And of course, this is, this is a part of the Christian life. Through the sacrament of penance, we don't just attempt to admit our faults. We don't try to turn our lives around by our own strength. It's our own weakness that gets us into a lot of these troubles in the first place. But we go to the church... We blame ourselves for our sins and we promise God 
that we're going to try to amend our lives. But not by our own strength, but with the strength that He promises to give us. We promise when we say an act of contrition, for example, we promise to amend our lives by the help of His grace. And He promises to help us. He he desires to help us. But He only helps those who are humble. He won't help a person like this prodigal young man who blames others for his own sins. God gives grace to the humble, St. Peter says in the New Testament. And so we've got to be honest about our sins. We've got to blame ourselves for our sins. And we've got to amend our lives with the help that God promises that he will supply us through, and I shouldn't only say the sacrament of penance because the same grace is also promised to us through the sacrament of the Eucharist. So by participating in the sacramental life as Christians, receiving the grace that God offers us in the church, we can confess our sins and also amend our lives and not live with this foolish spirit whereby men who commit sins think to blame others for their sins, which is irrational. And the image of this man blaming a bird for his own sins is a good illustration of how foolish it is to try to blame anyone for decisions we make for ourselves. This is Aesop's fable of the spendthrift and the swallow. God bless.